Thank you. My name is Henrik Götberg. Um, I worked in Vattenfall for the last seven years, uh, head of business intelligence in, in the B2B space, and then moving into uh, corporate space, and, and uh, been focusing the last couple of years in Vattenfall up until December 18, as, uh, in, a in, a, in a job title called Data and Analytics Transformation Lead. So within that space, what, I, what I've been working on and what I'm still working on is how do you get st this stuff to work? So how do you get started? How do you, how do you get going? What are the things that you need to be working around, around the algorithm, so to speak, to put things into you know, operations and production, to get operational value? So, so, so my big um, passion has always been about the how topic, but not always about the how how to code, but, but how do we work as people? So that's what, uh, what I'm going to talk about today, but I'm going to do some, some stuff here. I want to take a people's perspective on the journey of becoming data and AI ready. So when we take a people's perspective, we can, when you sit in here now, you, you can reflect with me during this whole uh, presentation on two levels. So you can talk about and think about this What's the pe pe people perspective around succeeding with my HR analytics? What's the people perspective of making HR data and AI ready to be a, a, a data and AI ready function? Okay, this is here and now for, for you know, uh, around people analytics. But I propose to you, this is one of the most important topics in the bigger sense uh, of your company because if we don't have HR being data and AI ready, how will you be relevant to enable the company to become data and AI ready? So whatever I'm talking about today, you can even think about it for my own HR function, and then you can switch hat and put on your CEO hat and think about me as HR enabling and supporting this. So we had a, a, a great quote in, in one of the other presentations before, HR is not about HR, HR is about business. I like that. So, in this perspective, how big of a deal is this what we're talking about? 10, 20, 70. So, there, you always, you've heard about the 80, 20 rule. Here's the 10, 20, 70 rule, or 70, 20, 10 rule. There's different f examples of this rule if you Google it. Uh, you, know, you know, how you drive innovation, 10, 20, 70. I have taken my spin on it. If you want to create value out of data and AI, or analytics or BI, it's 10% about algorithms, 20% about the data and the technology stack to enable this, and then it's 70% about people and their ways of working, so operating procedures, clarity of roles, having people working together in teams. So it's quite interesting. The people in this room has more to do with the success of your companies to become data and AI ready, if I read that 70% rule, than IT. Maybe? Doesn't matter. What I'm trying to make a point here is that the people point is fundamental. So AI is not about robots. AI is about people you know, being able to code robots, in, in, or AIs, or whatever you want to call it or utilize, adopt it in, in the normal task, in, in the normal uh, uh, business. So what I want to do now, I want to sort of drive a presentation where we, I'm sort of setting a, a context. How do, I, how do we look at the data and AI opportunity? Ultimately, why is this so hard? Why is this a challenge? And especially if you're coming from an organization with a proud analog legacy, like Vattenfall has a lot of physical really physical assets, like nuclear power plants, stuff like this. It makes it even harder than if you're a completely digital company in many ways. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to make you take a step back, look at the big picture of you know, why is this so hard, to have respect for the work that is going forward. And then I'm at the same time going to stretch you in terms of how far will this go? Where, where are we going? 2030, how will it look like around this 2030? So let's, let's start. What's the data and AI opportunity all about? So in my view of this, 
the more I have been on this journey within Vattenfall, going through all the different business units in Vattenfall, working with group, staff function, HR, finance, etc. It's clear that you have a data and analytics or BI opportunity in every single process. So you, we more and more we understand that we can use, utilize data in different ways. And, and then one of the main challenges is, of course, that we don't know what we don't know, so we don't know that we can do something better. We are so stuck in the way we have done things a lot of times, yeah? So, but just to give you a snapshot, one, now, let's talk about the data and AI opportunity. We have two hats on. So you can read these slides for your whole organization, or you can even read them only for your own HR department. So if I talk about the data and AI opportunity, how to create value, there are some fundamental use case clusters, some fundamental types of values that we are creating. So we're using data and analytics to improve decision making. Most of the stuff that we've been talking about here today has been in this space. Insights, analytics, BI, to start you know, having better understanding of the problem so we can act upon it. But if, if we stretch this journey now, think about where this is going, we're going to go into the realm of algorithmic processes and businesses. And all, already today, it's happening all around us. And it's you know, really to be done also in HR right now. If I go to the example of you know, a digital replacement of an existing task or processes, so, uh, robotic process automation, RPA, you know, different ways how we can automate things that are very very repetitive. It's already happening today and we can do it today. So if I take HR as a function, we have in, in Vattenfall, we would call it HR Direct. You know, the service you go in, and you, it's more and more being coming self-service anyway, or it's a self-service approach or call center approach, and then we do something. So that whole thing becomes more and more automated in a different way and self-service in different ways. Then we have our HR business partners, we go into um, sometimes the more strategic sto uh, topics. But you see what I mean? It's everywhere. So it's more about having the understanding for how it could be used and to grow that understanding. And ultimately, I think also in HR, what is the business model or the operating model of an HR function? How will that work when, it's complete, when, when we're becoming more and more digitized? Now, do I have my HR business partner Chatbot, do, you know, what do I, you know, stuff like this. So just to stretch you a little bit, another key topic here that I want to stress over and over again is how do you go from data to value? So we're doing a lot of analytics we're talking about today. There's been a lot of, you know, different types of dashboards and BI, but never ever forget that in order to go to value, there is, there is a, a sequence here. And if we're using words, example, examples of different types of analytics, so imagine now I want, to, I want to build an algorithmic business. So I want to digitize something which is, you know, with, with, with the algorithms in the bottom. Now you have your descriptive analysis. So descriptive analysis is the reporting stuff, right? The reporting can be visualizations. We start doing drill downs. We do different things of, to diagnose why we have a problem to understand our problem better. Then we move into the realm of predicting. We do different things to predict stuff. We, we get further, we need, we need to have an analytical model on top. We had, you know, Luke had, you know, highlighted random forest algorithms to support us with employee, ch uh, employee churn, uh, as an example, right? Great stuff. You know, but of course, if you think about algorithmic processes, we don't stop here. We need to go further. If you go to the doctor, you know, I have a diagnosis. I can predict my time when I'm going to die from cancer. I want a prescription. I want, I want something, you know, what am I doing? I want to take that uh, into decisions. Can I automate decisions? You know, so this ladder I'm highlighting here, this analytical ladder, or, and there are m many examples of it today, and I saw a couple today. Some of them, you know, you know it's a journey we are moving on, and, and what we have seen now is, is literally, from a technology point of view, that we are sort of growing from, you know, we're having our, our normal source systems to provide uh, data, we get to information, and then the human, the analog side takes over. We do the synthesizing the insight, and we take the action and decision. And the, low, uh, the logical progression, what, what is happening right now, is that with 
with more and more fancy algorithms and stuff like this, we will come more and more into you know, uh, different ways how this becomes automated or augmented. So and you can go into doctor type jobs, you can go into nurses type jobs, you can go into the factory. So you will have your, you know, the, the task that the human being doing that requires number crunching, you will get support. So to get to that support becomes this whole topic, from data model to analytical model, decision model, business process model, and then of course, ultimately, UX model. Right. If I'm taking a, 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 a people perspective on this slide now, have a look at on, the lower, on, the, on the lower part of this. What are the core competences that we're dealing with in order to get here? We're dealing with fundamentally IT in order to get the data, we are dealing with the mathematician who can do the algorithms and understand which, stat or a statistician who can understand what type of model is suitable for this topic. The more and more we go into UX decisions process, we are hardcore in the middle of the domain expertise. So the domain expertise in this room is about HR. Okay. Now, if I, if I do another conference, we can talk about you know doctors. We can talk about manufacturing customer, retail, we heard before. But bottom line, in order to work in this environment, you get to a topic where, you know, this is very much a team play. The more fancy you get in terms of using algorithms and BI, your core team needs to have these fundamental capabilities. And I'm not talking about how we organize it. If we have a, a central team of data scientists, I'm talking about the fundamental daily work needs to be then virtually structured in some sort of team way. This is one key lesson. So what we are doing now is ultimately then looking at, and one way of explaining this, Ventra Kamen did in, from MIT Sloan in 1996, trying to define how do we go from data to value. So, so, so DCAR, remember those key, that acronym, data turn into information, turn into knowledge, turn into action, turn into result. I heard another presentation, you know, Tyler uh, presented be before, you know, the dashboard is not the end game, you know? The, the information is not the end game, the insight is not the end game, it's what we do with it that matters. So regardless of how mature we are, if we're working with BI, vis visualization, we're somewhere here, it's fantastic. But you need to think about what are you doing as, a, you know, as processes and actions and people to take it into results. So this is to me a little bit a way to describe the difference between the tra traditional IT and the, the, the future IT, or the modern IT that is what Google and, 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 and these guys are doing. So they have gone from data systems that are suitable to work with you know, data and information. So we're talking uh, level five grade math. You know, plus, minus, times, division, percentages. That's what a database logic is all about. And what we're doing now, we're adding other types of technologies and systems that allows us to, do, to come further and use other types of uh, mathematical approaches, ultimately. So, so it's not rocket science, and it, it, is sort of, it is happening around us. So why is this so hard now? Let, let's dig into this. So I use the word DARE. I love DARE. Data AI ready. DARE ducks. Ducks is guide uh, in Latin. So data AI ready, I think what this journey is all about. We said it a lot, a lot of times, this is a journey. Doesn't matter where we start, doesn't matter how bad data it is, doesn't matter how immature we are, doesn't matter if you're the best of the best. It is a journey that we're on uh, and that has certain challenges. So I'm gonna highlight some of the challenges that are especially prevalent in the, in the analog type organization. So if you're not a data native, so to speak. Okay, so the DARE challenge. The way it has been described in many presentations has been like, sh even the latest big data and AI survey now in 2019, I, I found this uh, as an executive summary of that survey from Harvard Business Review, yeah? Uh, but they basically highlight that we're investing more, this is, an, uh, I think it's an American survey, we are investing more across all the different types of industries, but we are we are, the perception is that we are less data driven. So why is that? So it's a little bit like we are in pouring money into this, 
But I, I think we're missing the 70 percenter quite a bit. Okay? Now, if you start looking at this topic now, I think what we are dealing with here is a, is, is a true paradigm shift, and it's happening right around us. That's what's making this so hard. And let me explain what I mean with this paradigm shift. So, if you imagine this challenge now, and we are, we are now zooming into this as a company, yeah? or you could even zoom into it, uh, uh, you know, your chief uh, human resource officer or something like that. You have a strategic challenge around this, you have a middle manager challenge around this, you know, how we need to staff up and organize ourselves, and we have the fundamental solutions, how we're going to work in the future. So on the highest level, I'm going to very quickly scheme through this so we get to the actual you know, human capital part. But, but this is about the context, understanding where, where we're at. Uh, in a summary, on a strategic level, on the ultimate strategic level, I interpret the world right now that we are in a macro life cycle shift. So what I mean with that is that, imagine we have come from an agricultural society in Europe, we move into a, the industrial area. We have an industrial society from the 18, 1900s. That is, that we, you know, we were pioneering factories and the way to work around this. If I take Vattenfall, it's a 100-year-old company. We were pioneers very long time ago, and we have reached a peak where we sort of mature now. So a lot of the stuff we do in the traditional companies has a lot to do with efficiency, how to act and be successful in a mature marketplace. Now. If I now flip this and say we're gonna, we, we are actually leaving that product life cycle or macro life cycle and we're, we're entering a new one, it's, a, it's the life cycle of a data and AI first society. So what I'm saying is that even if we had uh, computerization for a long time, we have the web, we have started, when we now unleash data algorithms, having the IoT sensors to capture data, we get to the next level of how we can build this ladder how we can automate and, and build algorithms into our core processes. That's a shift. So it really means that we are doing some sort of reset, reboot of our old organizations. So it means your steering, your culture, your organizational structure are set up for focusing on efficiency. And ultimately what we need to do now is to understand that we are in a pioneering stage. We're in a growth and innovation stage of our core processes. So we need to reinvent our core processes. HR is not here to do a little about, this is not about digital sugar coating, right? It's about reinventing how do we operate HR, or how do we operate the co company? I love what we talked about in King, yeah? You have the same story, it's actually the same story. You know, so I'm, I'm glad, I'm not alone. If, if we take this story now, we come to some, some sort of key, the trillion dollar question, so McKinsey is saying that the, the GDPR, uh, the GNP, uh, uh, not GDPR, GNP will you know, increase with you know, trillions of dollars based on uh, opportunities in AI. So the core question becomes, how do I reimagine my new company or my company when it's flying in this new world? And how do I uh, imagine the journey to get there? Now for me, when you talk about that, I want to propose to you a couple of key things that I think has a, 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 a key impact on how we design our journeys and how, how we get started and what we are working on. So now I'm going to the next level, the capabilities we need. So imagine like this, that before we get started on a project and we are working on this, I'm, I'm asking you to take one step back to understand what is it that's going to be really challenging and what, are, what is it that we need to navigate to make this work. And here I have three main uh, key messages. I'm not going to dig into them really deep, but I'm, I'm going to point them out. The first one is that what we are dealing with here, I, I think you can call intersectional innovation. So basically, the opportunity of what the new company is going to be all about when it's data and AI driven is, is living, your whole organization will be living in the intersect between data and AI capability and your domain legacy capability. So if you imagine your big organization, it's what your company does. If you're taking this as an HR department, the new core HR will be living in the intersect between HR, domain expertise, and what we do with data and AI. And this is quite profound, because if you go back to the last picture, it means if we imagine a new organization in one year, five years, I don't know, but if you, if you, if you stretch yourself, 
we need to be able to sort of work in this intersect. And to get to value now is the tricky part. To get to value when it comes to data and AI is, is really a multiplier of several different core facets. So one key facet is you know, to ensure you understand your use case, your problem you're trying to solve. Employee churn, like very concrete. Then you need to understand the data. You need to be able to build the data pipeline, the data sets. You need to be able to build the algorithm. Then you need to move over to understand, do we have the right data, data stewardship stuff? And we get into fundamentally, how do we work? What's the technology stack all about? What's the operating procedures? How do I do DevOps? How do I do Agile? How does system software development really work? The value is a multiplier effect, but it also means that if you take one of those key topics out of the equation and put that to zero, the result is zero. So when we go into this journey now, it means we need to be good at and invest in several facets to get to value. So I'm not talking about dashboards because we need dashboards. I'm talking about getting to operational value. I'm talking about getting to a bottom line adoption about stuff. Okay. So here, here, here becomes the challenge then. That, that, you know, if you do really big projects, it becomes super complex, scary, and risky. So it really drives this drip feeding approach that you are really concrete on what you're trying to do to manage all the different facets to go to value, to put something in production. One key learning. Second key learning here is going to be about uh, our key processes becomes uh, life cycles, continuous innovation, perpetual innovation. So imagine you have a core process now. You have your core HR processes. If I'm now starting to build more and more data sets, if I'm starting to build more algorithms or visualizations, I'm literally drip feeding and changing my process continuously. So this is what we're talking about then, that you go from process ownership to more like product ownership. So it's, it's a, you, you are rebooting how you look at processes. And this has to do with a stable process, I draw, I draw swimming lanes, makes a hell of a lot of sense when the process is stable because we're in a mature stage, the process has looked the same way for the last 10 years. If I'm now adding algorithms and data and visualizations in an agile way every three weeks, the process is continuously evolving. So the organization needs to ma manage that stuff. So that's why waterfall project ma methodology is dead, right? It doesn't work. You need to drip feed this if you want to get it into value. The, lo the last topic here on the middle manager agenda that is really hard in the big corporation, I call it the, the, the enterprise data AI ready dilemma. So all the stuff we're talking about here now, when we're going down to algorithms, is very, very concrete, very, very operational. It's one specific problem at a time, one algorithm at a time, one data set at a time, one data pipeline at a time. Okay, so the value to go to operations is around that fundamental process that you're you know, innovating. So we need to work on that level. Okay, at the same time, we don't want to have anarchy. We don't want to have our, our, our businesses completely fragmented. So we have a tendency that we want to start big. We want to start with a big transformation project. We want to have enterprise synergies. So the, the balancing act here is to have the focus on the operational use case on the one hand, but then scaling it so it becomes enterprise capabilities. So all this stuff, that's what sort of kind of makes this hard and sort of, it sort of kills the traditional transformation idea. The traditional, we have an assist situation, we have a to be situation, and we try to do a gap analysis, and we build a roadmap for that gap analysis. It starts to fall apart. You know, so you need to literally think about the new core as a moving target. So if anyone tells you that they can define how HR should work with, with, with arrogance and say, you know, I know the shit, they have no clue. Google doesn't know. It's advancing at a rapid pace, the technology. AI is fairly immature. You need to be quite sharp on open source technology approaches to do it right now. But that's changing. It's changing by the minute. Uh, uh, AWS SageMaker, you know, Peltarion, uh, Data Robot, you know, different technologies helping us to put AI in production without being rocket scientists or data scientists. 
So if you're imagining this now, perpetual intersexual innovation is what we are going for that our company can deal with. We're going to have a new human core in, term, in terms of these data scientists or data savvy guys. It's going to work very close to our domain people. We have a new operations core, which is set more from a lifecycle product innovation perspective than from a core standard process perspective. We have growing data assets core, analytical assets, core data assets, and we have advanced in technology. So it's a little bit like if that old model now, the to be is continuously moving. So the new normal is a continuously moving. And that's, that's quite normal, yeah? It's, it's, it's progression in some ways. Now, if we talk about this now from where, you know, if you have this mindset now, what are the key roadblocks? What, what becomes, if we look this, at this as a journey, and maybe even a never-ending journey, what's hard? What makes this really hard? I call one, the one for, first core topic is new core literacy. So understanding what it means to live and work and set operations in the new core. Uh, David was onto it before. He talked about data literacy. So for the people with domain expertise, it literally means to become more data and AI literate. Those high level topics he talked about. What is the data pipeline all about? What is algorithms all about? What is visualization all about? How does it work? Yeah? In order for you to function and discuss in a team with the data scientist next to you. But I want to call it new core literacy because what I see is I see these flashy data scientists coming out of university, think they are the shit, and then I drop them into Vattenfall and they get completely lost. They don't have the domain expertise. They don't have the understanding for, you know, for, for, for how a big corporation works. What do you mean? You don't have data? You know, they're all like kids in the candy store, like Luke, you know, in LinkedIn. It's easy to be a data scientist in LinkedIn, Luke. A little bit tougher in your new situation. You know, so the data scientist, you know, he needs to learn to live in an analog world. <laughs> You know, new core literacy. We need to meet in the middle. Tayloristic leadership. Our culture, our steering, our ways of working, how you know, what, what makes you a leader, come from driving, you know, the traditional driving efficiency. I have a stable process. I can do separation of tasks. It's actually maybe a good idea when it's a very stable process. It's a shitty idea when we are innovating. You know, Jeff Bezos starting Amazon. He did it in a garage. He was lifting the boxes himself, right? Of course, he's not a garage anymore. But from one point of view, on a team level, this is what's going to happen. So all of you guys here have a challenge because you don't have data scientists next to you. You need to figure that out. BI guys, OK? Figure it out. You, know, don't, you don't need to hire them, but you need to figure out those structures, get the money, get the, you know. It's not going to fly if you don't have the domain expertise you know, the analytics expertise and the data expertise, engineering expertise. They need to work together. Culture, yeah? I'm going from an efficiency culture to an innovation culture. I'm going into a learning organization type culture, sharing culture, collaboration culture, away from a silent culture. What, these are yellow, by the way, because I find these topics highly relevant for HR to tackle, yeah? This is what we need HR to help us with in the big corporations to drive this. We, it, we can't leave it up to the, each manager to try to figure this out alone if we want to build an enterprise approach to it. You need to figure this out inside your HR department, but ultimately, the more you learn by doing, the more relevant you will become to make your whole company succeed. So what we are talking about here is laying a 1,000 piece puzzle, and it's still going to be done piece by piece. So summarizing, we need to look at the new core as a moving target, so we need to focus on the innovation engine. We need to think about that the real effort is on quite operational level. Algorithms is happening quite low, yeah? Ones and zeros, by the way. We need to work as an enterprise, yeah? So we need to, this dare dilemma, it's not gonna go away just because we stick our hand in the sand. We need to design a, a, a learning culture. We need to design cross-sharing by design. So you have a huge effort now within your organization where I think HR needs to take a step up. How do I create the learning and design the learning organization? Absolutely vital for this. Why learning organization? Because what I do in one use case, I want to reuse it somewhere else. 
If this has been built in a silo, it can't be used. With data, that's just a huge problem. Too complex, too big to do as a transformation project is my recipe, but we can't have anarchy either. So how to deal with topics just in time? And then I think, from my point of view, when it comes to this topic, it's a little bit, we said in Vattenfall, no more PowerPoints. We need to learn by doing, okay? Peer-to-peer, -peer, sharing, working with the guys that are, if you're in cooperation, I, I can tell you there's a spectrum in Vattenfall between guys who are really, really good at this to, to functions that hasn't started. They need to work, they need to, they need to learn from each other. So all this stuff that we've been doing now, this is what I've been working on in Deadox as an alliance to, as open source, think about, you know, how can we think about that? What's the model here? And the model we are, we are, we are thinking about is really thinking very pragmatically about what's happening on the use case level. You know, what do you need to do in order to create the business value from innovation to adoption, the whole change mechanism? What do you need to do from a business solution perspective? You know, Designing the solution, designing the code, building the pipelines, and what do you need to do in order to make that into assets? So if you get it right, first of all, get it right on a use case level, because without the use case into production, you have no value. Then you can think about scaling it. Scale it through how you build federated sharing and governance. So you need to design community, and from community mandates to build decisions. So this, the, the federated sharing and governance is all about enterprise scaling. Now, the strategy here is very simple. By working day one on use cases and doing this consistently, you know, imagine like we get to a place where we can harvest the stuff that we're doing. That basically what is coming out of one use case is putting up, it's put up in the community, becomes best practice or policy, and becomes we can drop it as best practice in the next use case. So instead of saying what we heard before, we need to wait for two years before we have the data, we need to wait for two years before we have the platform, we need to wait for two years, you know, forget that, it's not gonna fly. You need to start working with one use case. And, and, the, and the positive thing with that is that when you come to data, you're gonna get lost if you try to do all data at once. So you start in one corner, but you do it right, so you can grow it, grow it, grow it. And if you think about your structural capital and all this in the same way, your human capital in the same way, you know, you evolve, you drip feed into this. In a place like Vattenfall, you know, my personal belief is that this is the only viable approach. Now, have a look down here. We're growing our data and AI DNA use case by use case. We have our pipelines, we get our technology and operating procedures stepwise in place. Ah, and we're getting our human leadership capabilities in place at the same time. Let's zoom in on that, that's my last slide. So let's zoom in now on the human capital approach. So what's the people perspective of succeeding uh, with, with, with what we have talked about this whole conference in your department, but ultimately when you've learned by doing it on yourself, taking your own medicine, you're in a great position to, take, you know, to be a, a player in, in, in your organization. So when I looked at that, we, I tried to sort of structure it in a way this is my thought. I'm trying to structure what I have learned in Vattenfall. So human capital, you know, uh, are people, yeah? And we have some different perspectives that we really need to work on. And ultimately, we need to enable the human capital by doing certain things that I think typically find, you know, could, could be filled by the HR function. So we have stuff that needs to be to happen on the enterprise level, team level, individual level. We have stuff that needs to happen on a quite strategic level and stuff that is down on a very, very operational level. If I start here, first of all, we need to embrace the new roles. You know, data scientist, you know, BI analyst, uh, data steward. You know, they don't even have proper job descriptions. You know, if I go in and ask for a job description for business control, I get, you know, I can get all the different ladders, right? I go into the engineering department, I get all the different ladders. And then now we want to hire a data scientist. Hello, HR! You know, I can't get any help because they don't have no knowledge about this. So if you want to get real on this, get started on the normal HR stuff on, on, on roles and descriptions. Training and coaching. Data literacy is a key issue here. How are we going to drive that? How are we going to drive data and AI literacy with the, you know, with the normal people, so to speak? How are we going to drive, you know, if I'm going to go from being a Tayloristic leader 
to a servant leader in Agile taking care of autonomous teams, there's some adult learning going on here, guys, and it's massive. You're going to have frameworks if you want to work together. You're going to train that. You're going to have experts. More strategic side, how are you going to deal with talent in this space? How are you going to recruit? How do we build a career ladder for a data scientist? You know, how do we make ourselves attractive from the core basics around the new organization that, you know, if you haven't seen it yet, I promise you, you will see it in 10 years, five years, hopefully in less. The last topic I want to highlight is the whole cultural topic. For me, it becomes clear that, you know, culture sits in the walls in some ways, and if you want to change that culture, there's a couple of ways of doing it. You need to replace the people. It's like a team, yeah? How many, pe how many people do you need to replace to, to change your culture? Quite a few. The other topic is about designing and investing in, in a culture shift. So if you, if you want to have a learning organization, if you want to have sharing innovation, you need to have very strategic investment and in driving that uh, to the fullest. So this is sort of what I you know, try to condense what I think is HR topics that are super important for you to succeed with your HR and analytics approach, but ultimately makes you super relevant for the journey for your company. Okay, with that. Thank you, Henry. I would like to stop.